Welcome back, everyone, to another university segment here at Reimagine 2020 V2. I'm Roshan Marachkar, the University Program Assistant Director here at Mouseboat, and I'm very excited to have a returning guest here. With me, I have Daniel Adabimpe, the founder of the Duquesne Technology Group. Daniel, it's so great to have you back. Uh, why don't we get started with letting everyone know what you've been up to the past three months since we last spoke? Yeah. Thanks for having me. Um, so after the last um, time we spoke, uh, I've really started to understand uh, this whole concept of, of systems theory and uh, network network science. And uh, really this, this sets the stage uh, or helps you understand um, blockchain's impact uh, and all the implications um, a lot better. And uh, what, what systems theory, what the core concept of it is, is that, uh, you know, you, when you normally look at a system, uh, you, you try to reduce it to, to the sum of its parts. So you can see how uh, the components um, in summation uh, contribute to the overall function of, of whatever the system is. And uh, what systems theory it, it says or, or what it what it represents is that um, these it's a system isn't just a summation of its parts um, but that these are um, that it's about the way that these parts are interrelated and how they interdepend and that's what uh, uh, you know gives what gives rise to the to the macro level outcome and so uh, these these are these are um, realizations that are now occurring, I, I believe, and blockchain is really a technology to to realize this and, and embody this this sort of change in a paradigm. Um, and, and so, um, we've seen um, the the new rise for, of systems theory um, as a result of like 18th century uh, developments where you could measure you could measure things with with currencies. Um, and so now you had a lot of uh, different uh, production uh, and, and then things started to come together and interdepend with one another. And that gave rise to this new, new type of uh, concept or paradigm. And, and I think the blockchain technology is, is like I said, uh, um, the technology that's really gonna realize these, these truths. Yeah, it's interesting how you, uh, you specifically talk about uh, yeah, systems theory and kind of the the systems that gov govern us. You know, our theme this time around is uh, reimagining the system, you know, really talking about not only how we can reinvent the way things work, but also uh, I want to kind of get deeper into what you're discussing, which is actually talking about w what is different. So uh, why do you think that so many people don't talk about kind of the network effect or the value of um, the, the, the system specifically related to blockchain? Like we have, is it the same as uh, Facebook's value prop with the amount of uh, users or the network it's built? Or do you think it's uh, different, like a different type of value you get with blockchain? Um, yeah, I think the, the value in blockchain um, lies in the, uh, the, the decentralized effect or the self-organizing ability so um you know facebook and other companies had tremendous uh, network effects mm -hmm. and uh that was in part because uh i don't think these technologies were were really around at, at the time but um i think the core the core uh competency for for a for blockchain technology is is enabling uh, a person to own a protocol or own um, an exact uh, part or stake in a network and contribute to this whole, as I've been saying, as, the, as they're a smaller subsystem contributing to a larger outcome. And I think that's really the, 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 really the, the proposition. And I think you'll see the network effects happen when, uh, when, when the technology is really set in place and, and people really understand this. Are there any, uh, are there any certain aspects of um, how the world works right now that you think that this uh, this idea of replacing it with a different network could affect? 
Uh, I know I know you are a fan of decentralized autonomous organizations and for the audience out there. So what is the main idea of a DAO and could it actually um, work in our current society or is it something like we need way more evolution and we're not ready for it? Yeah, definitely. Um, yeah, I think I think that these things are are going to, to start to be implemented, uh, the DAOs. Um, and, and basically the DAO is just, um, is an organization that, that doesn't have a top down or doesn't have a hierarchical structure, um, that you could kind of come and go as you please. And, um, and the idea here is, um, that, uh, the code governs what goes on in the, in the, uh, organization and, uh, and people's stakes, uh, or, or, their affiliation with with the organization is based on merit and basically your skin in the game so we can start to develop um, these economic sets where people um, with with the expertise in whatever field this is can can hold the uh, the precedence or or take take kind of the charge in these self-organizing systems and and you you mentioned uh, are these are these platforms that that will uh, come out soon or, or is it maybe, or are we not there yet? Uh, I think that they will come out, come out soon because again, the, the understandings in, in network, um, uh, or systems theory, um, that really describes our, our economy as a, as a really a complex economy, not just this closed system, but that it's a constant open system where, um, we're always in um, this equilibrium. And, uh, and I think uh, like a lot of these things have already happened and, and you see companies like Uber and, and Airbnb and the rest that we'd all talk about. Uh, those are companies that, that, that are supposed to be, in my opinion, decentralized uh, organizations based on their models. And you can kind of see how those guys are, are suffering because, uh, you know they're 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 exposed. Um, they're vulnerable because because their business model uh, and strategy doesn't isn't corresponding to the actual development of of the value that they're creating. So I think that decentralized organizations will absolutely take place in the in these next five years. And there's there's some really good projects that uh, that I, I like that I'm interested in, and um, you know we'll, we'll have to wait and see. Yeah, I really like how you uh, explained that because I think everyone watching is familiar with uh, Uber and other and other platforms and already knows the value that you get while using them. But I definitely agree with you that um, if you look at uh, the value of the entire organization, we're not sure if, uh, you know, it, it's actually the, the drivers and maybe the riders that are making a service going. But uh, if you look at how much of the value goes to drivers, may maybe not many. Um, since you mentioned projects, um, since we last spoke, is there any interesting projects that Duquesne is currently working on? Or are there any interesting projects that um, you're interested in working on areas like uh, Nigeria or other parts of the world right now uh, because of the situation of uh, COVID and how that's affected them? Yeah, that's right. Um, yeah, I actually didn't give an update on uh, the lab or, or the technology lab. Um, so, like I said, we kind of want to take this sort of systems approach. And so we, we want to look at uh, four really main systems or popular systems uh, being um, finance, uh, law, uh, healthcare, and supply chain. And And once we start to use these new uh, methods to to look at systems um, we can then take technologies like blockchain um, to then start uh, implementing on, on different leverage points so that we can generate the changes that we that we want um, so covid and uh, and also the the movements of black lives matter and those protests you can really start to see how that's shaping um, different forms of organization. Um, and, uh, you know, I think those things 
um, those events are, are tipping points into this into this future that that we've all been talking about for for a very long time. Um, now, in terms of projects, um, Nigeria is is my uh, my 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 dad's uh, homeland, so my homeland. Um, so and and they're they're uh, really ripe for for uh, new technology and um, DeFi. Uh, things like DeFi are are main applications that that can really see some some extraordinary uh, development in there. Um, so um, the, the, both of those are really the projects we want to do. Um, we want to research on these various systems and then identify these points where new technology can can make a difference. Um, and and for Nigeria, we can uh, start to uh, give people. Uh, identities first and foremost so that, uh, digital identities so that they can uh, lock up specific assets generate more liquidity and get funding for a lot of new ventures um, that's Nigeria and other countries in Africa's biggest problem is that they uh, they have trouble uh, getting funding out especially in those local smaller communities and those are those are really the things that we're interested in yeah, it's like uh, so, so many times I think a lot of blockchain solutions are trying to search for a problem, but I do think that some of this technology has the potential to even the playing field or give opportunities to basically disenfranchised uh, groups. Uh, we know many people are unbanked. Uh, what, I, I thought it was interesting that you said like, um, you know, they can use, they can use DeFi but you also mentioned that the first thing you would want to work on is giving them identities. Uh, why do you think that this whole DeFi craze that we're seeing right now, um, why is it Why is it that people get so excited and there's so much hype just around the financial aspects of, let's say, let's say blockchain? So it's like decentralized yeah. finance. Um, why do you, Why do you think that we people think about that? first uh other than some of the other things you mentioned like identity yeah yeah um i think just because there's so much uh, untapped value um that the blockchain really is best at um digitizing assets um and so there's there's so many different pieces of value that are yet to be captured and traded with distributed ledgers and uh and um i also think that uh, well, yeah, I also think that, uh, new assets, uh, or old assets, like in, in the real estate, um, business, you could say, um, it is really illiquid and, and, and tough to trade. And so once you, you use a, a blockchain technology to kind of disseminate this and unbundle the market, um, it, it can really. Uh, lead to a more porous and, and fluid um, system of, of value exchange. And I think that's what really is, is getting people excited uh, that, that there can be a lot of different value creation and uh, create more wealth, but we can distribute it to, to many different people. Um, but I think that all starts first with identity, um, giving people um, digital identities that, that they can own and that are, or that are theirs and that are private, uh, those things are are uh, even more important, in my opinion, as we uh, as we see how big data technology um, threatens to to kind of flip that on its head, and, and how governments, you know, want to see everything and surveil everything. Yeah, exactly. Um, gov I think governments are very much needed, but this whole topic of basically governance that uh, that everyone has been talking about for the past couple of months is like this new new wave in the industry where um, you know back a couple of years ago people were just more so investing on speculation. There's still a good amount of speculation, but now we're actually seeing uh, protocols being developed where uh, people can have a vested uh, stake and a vested interest, such as earning interest on your money or decision making. So why don't we go down 
uh, this talk a bit to, I want to get your perspective on uh, what you think about like the governments around the world, their, their role and what they're doing in blockchain. So they're developing things like uh, CBDCs, central bank digital currencies. We're seeing them uh, try to maybe grasp more control out there. And I guess on the other side, at the same time, we're seeing these new protocols being developed where you actually have ownership of, let's say, a protocol and you actually have some uh, decision making and power. Do you think that going forward, um, you know, which which implementation sort of do you see having the most benefit to people, but also which implementation do you think um, is going to kind of uh, foster this technology forward? I'm sorry, you broke up really at the end, just there. Okay, yeah, no, uh, what, I, what I was asking you was, which implementation do you think will uh, bring us forward, help us uh, speed up the process of, let's say, adoption or, or real usage? You know, will it be the governments deploying their, gover their governance through like central bank digital currencies, or will it be these DeFi protocols where like anyone can use them around the world with just an internet connection? And suddenly you have like some leverage, right? Uh, right. Own, owning a protocol or even controlling decision making. You know, um, I think a lot of people in the world, even people in first world countries, don't really have that vested um, decision making. I would say, like, you don't really get to make a lot of decisions. You're just kind of whatever is whatever technology is available out there. You get to. Um, pick from from that but i would i wouldn't say it's many times really a choice right yeah yeah that's a very that's a very good point and um i mean i certainly hope that it's the decentralized protocols that take form before the governments can implement their strategies first but i don't um at the end of the day i don't see anything stopping the emergence of of, of decentralized uh governance and and giving people um, the ability to get in on the ground floor of of new projects and have uh, decision making power um, based on their reputations or their skin in the game, you could say. Um, and uh, yeah, I think uh, what really would um, enforce that is um, having a, a really nice interface for people to to browse these different projects and to buy different sorts of tokens and, and give them information on what these organizations are doing, uh, what they can do within them, um, maybe giving certain, uh, some sort of identity to, um, or different types of identities in a, in a system or an organization um, that enable them to perform a specific task um, but but there needs to be an interface for people to to uh, to be empowered to to do these things. Uh, I think that's the whole essence of of the blockchain is that so people can participate and uh, self organize. And um, yeah, and I'll make a, one last point. Um, there's this um, idea of of stigmergy, and um, and that's that's really uh, the the starter of, of self-organization. And it, it started by um, the scientist was looking at how ants could self-organize and how they lay down pheromones so that other ants can come into the trails and then they can form these long, uh, these long trails where, where they, where they bring the food back to their, to their mounds or whatever, what have you. Um, but, but th that same, uh, concept and can really take form um, with with blockchain technologies, and we can generate uh, positive feedback um, through having the this, um, like I said, interface for people to to come on, uh, join the network, uh, see what other people are doing, and, uh, and and begin to to organize themselves. Yeah, I certainly just learned something uh, new, and I always find it interesting whenever 
uh, people make comparisons like that because it's like something that people um, kind of understand or happens naturally. And um, it's interesting uh, when dealing with blockchain, how I would say a lot of the procedures or even ideas, um, some of them seem like very natural ideas, but there's always a lot of pushback. And I think it's because um, it just boils down to power and I would say trust. And I want to get your thoughts on you know, whether going back to the, the CBDC kind of talk, um, do you think that people, do you think that people out there that are, you know, not in the industry at all, haven't really used any of the technology at all, um, you know, is it going to be a net benefit if the first time they interact with something like digital currencies, you know, it is created from the government? Or do you think they will actually have more trust in and in seeing the trust the, themselves, if that makes sense, because I think for all of us in the industry, seeing it grow, um, I would I would even compare it to how the internet grew. It's like you have a small group of people that actually interacted with it, used it, and can actually see the value. Like I just sent that piece of data to you know my friend uh, uh, across the United States or something like that. And even at that time, a lot of people thought that the internet was going to go away. It was a fad. People didn't understand. Um, how to use it. But this time, I feel like what we're actually dealing with is like, all, not only is all of this technology built on top of the internet, but then now you're actually asking people um, to kind of trust a technology uh, that they don't know or understand. So yeah, I want to get your thoughts to see if like, do you think it would be bad if the first time they interacted with these technologies, it's not the traditional um, technology that startups and uh, DeFi protocols are building. Like, because I have, we have seen a lot of governments around the world, even in uh, Nigeria, Africa, um, places like Russia, uh, try to build their own own currency and deploy it to their people. Yeah, that's that's a really good um, question and a good point um, that I'll continue to think about, but. Um, I think it'll be a, a good thing ultimately uh, for people to participate in a decentralized protocol off the bat, um, as opposed to as opposed to a, a digital currency um, owned by the government. And I think that um, it really is is up to our gen the younger generation, uh, Generation Z, um, because they're the most aware. We the, we are the most aware about what how valuable data is and how um, data is, is, is ours, you know, by, by default. So um, once, once we have a mechanism and certain protocols that enable us to, to see that, then I think that that'll be a tremendous um, effect uh, that among, uh, among people. And ultimately it'll be a net benefit of what you're saying, but that that's, that's really, that's really interesting. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, I think we covered a lot of interesting points around how you really believe uh, that the systems thinking approach, like seeing the value proposition from that way, and maybe not seeing it uh, just from the approach of like, you can do transactions faster or even uh, cheaper, like you're talking about actually looking at the value of uh, a network, which I think is really interesting. And I think going forward um, for our audience out there should, I definitely agree with Daniel, should look more into um, looking at, let's say something like Bitcoin, you know, it's the most powerful, largest network out there. Uh, a lot of these protocols have a lot of uh, compute power or a lot of uh, stake money behind them. And I think a lot of the protocols that we interact with daily, it's, uh, there are there are these mechanisms or, or value that is staked behind them, but it's kind of all controlled by by one person, right? Um, so it doesn't really affect everyone the same. So uh, go, going forward, I guess just the next couple of months to the end of the year, you know, what is Duquesne uh, excited about doing in your region? You know, do you think you'll work together with? more organizations around uh, your region like you mentioned some other organizations in pennsylvania are you thinking about branching out um just want to get your final thoughts on you know what you see happening 
the next six months and kind of what your plan um, is out there in case anybody's interested in collaborating with you on uh, a study. You know, uh, here at Malta University, we've been uh, trying to group together students from different organizations and uh, kind of change our entire curriculum to best fit the, the virtual environment. Yeah. Yeah. So we, we absolutely want to form more partnerships and work with other organizations in the region. Um, and Pittsburgh's really uh, on the cusp of, a, of, of coming up as a rising technology hub. Um, of course, you have Carnegie Mellon uh, mm -hmm. speaking itself, and, and Pitt is big with, with healthcare. And now Duquesne, we're hoping to get uh, this systems idea uh, going. And so we're hoping that we can work with these, these um, schools and the organizations within these schools uh, to, to kind of build a new network of researchers, um, entrepreneurs, uh, students to learn, um, and even investors to, to, to build out new projects. But um, yeah, we, we, wanna, we wanna build a network um, where, where all these people can come together and we can, we can generate these outcomes that we want. Uh, and, and as for us personally, uh, those four systems, we, we really wanna be able to look into and take the technologies that we, we study and see how those can make an impact and, and deliver this change. Yeah, looking forward to what you'll accomplish in your region. And we're always there to support and stimulate these conversations. Where can people uh, reach out to you or learn more about um, the Duquesne Club? Yeah, so um, we have a website, um, duketechlab.com. Um, you can find us there and uh, our information's on there. Uh, and, and you can even log in create a login and get into some of our events. Uh, and then my Twitter handle is also on there. I, I tweet about our, our group and, um, you know, definitely, definitely looking forward to, to the future. And, and thank you. Thank you for having me, Roshan. Okay. Thank you, Daniel. Uh, thank you. Thanks everyone for tuning into the segment and uh, can tune back into reimagine 2020. Thank you.